Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Story number one. Zaphod brings his heritage gun to gun day. Written by Slow AD 2584. It was a bit of a tradition. A way to blow off steam at a bar at the edge of the proving grounds, high above the galactic plane. Several other alien races participated. It was cool and always interesting. It was called Gun Day, and the point of it was to show and tell primitive handguns from each species past. They would O and R amongst themselves, and even go and do some shooting practice in one of the large cargo bays that broke down freighters that the humans used. Chuck Yeager, the primary test pilot for the human contingent at the Proving Grounds, had his favorite antique, Old Bessie, a truly ancient Colt 1911.45 that he had in his family for, geez, was it really 48 generations? A testament to its design and the well-oiled gun still worked perfectly. After all these years, guns like these were called heritage guns under a special treaty article and were allowed to be carried on vessels out into space, as they were important cultural relics, or something. The 1911 was a favorite of the aliens at the Proving Grounds. While a simple gunpowder-propelled lead slug weapon, it was a stopping power, the muzzle energy of this unassuming device that impressed everyone still to this day. Tell me, uh, Jaeger, said one of the Klingons, not what they called themselves. Again, this is engineer nerdy references. One of the more like and militaristic species of the hegemony, thus the moniker. My, the need for this gun, over the other more common relics such as the 9mm. Mega loved telling the story. Well, great granddaddy used to say, the history books agreed that during World War II, the sidearms of the US Army before the 1911 were 9mm. And they had the unfortunate flaw in that they were not able to drop a man with one shot. In a moment when the main weapon jammed, and the soldier had to rely on his sidearm to stay alive. That's what the 1911 was engineered to meet. To just need one shot in the heat of the moment to utterly drop a man, even one junked up on PCP or whatever stimulants the enemy used back then. The Klingons nodded in approval. They had little doubt the handgun would drop any of them in one shot as well. It was just that much oomph going on. They then showed off their heirloom gun, the Needler. It was a gauze weapon, using strong electromagnetics to propel a swarm of slivers down the barrel. The rather ingenious thing about it was the ammunition. It was a solid slug of metal of a particular crystalline piezoelectric matrix. When the hammer struck the back and when it fired, a 0.5 mm outer layer of the slug would shatter off around the long circumference of the drum. Hundreds of razor-sharp needles of metal that were all accelerated down the gun to the target once freed. It was messy, inaccurate, and brutal. Pretty much like how the Klanons liked it. Oh, and the shattering of needles meant that they were red-hot as well when fired. The ancient weapon was used when we were warring factions on our world raiding each other for territory, or other. The needles were collected and used as currency for barter, meaning that the factions most shot to hell were able to repurchase themselves back up quickly. This weapon single-handedly spurred our technological development, they stated proudly. One of the aliens, a spider-centaur-looking thing, showed off their gun next. It was a whip-line caster, and it made everyone uneasy. Its bullets were monomolecular filaments, able to cut through anything at a molecular level. The gun looked like a kind of crossbow, but the arcing arms were the gun barrel. When fired, it sent out whip lines as horizontal filaments and rapid-fire twangs, shredding any target downfield. It had the interesting bonus ability, beyond what was more common projectiles and laser could achieve, the whoop part of it. Due to its nature, it could hook around corners over cover around door frames and window sills by snagging and whooping around, shredding anything hiding behind. Nowhere to hide. It was awesome to watch it in the firing range, though, but it was also horrible to clean up afterwards. Never nice to have monofilaments piled up on the floor. That never goes well. 
but Zaphod walked in with his heritage gun. The party really started. Zaphod Beeblebrox, nicknamed because he had two heads and three arms, was a member of the most technologically advanced species in the hegemony. They were literal hegemons, and as ancient handgun was more high-tech than anything else presented. This little darling was from our deep ancient past when, um, uh, we were sort of, um, uh, space buccaneers. Oh, wait, what? Zaphod, the space pirate, Jaeger proclaimed with a huge grin while handing Zaphod a goggle blaster. Look, kid, it was a long time ago. You don't see me bringing up your Spanish Inquisition or anything, do you? Anyway, this here is a hand pump x-ray blaster. Ha! No batteries required. Ain't she a beauty? It really did look ancient, but honestly, there wasn't much to look at. It was just a wooden grip, trigger, and a lever thing where the hand gripped it. Some sort of spinny revolver cylinder, some heavy gauge wires, and a metal rod poking out the end of a flared trumpet-like barrel. It was all secured in place with hammered brass strips. It looked all the world like a flintlock blunderbuss from the Pirates of the Caribbean movie with a few steampunk additions. One of the engineers couldn't resist asking, How does it work again? Zaphod shrugged, All right, I mean, there's nothing secret or classified here. How kids make these things for their elementary school science projects? The lever here in the grip is a crank squeezing the grip over and over, ratchets the drum into a spin faster and faster. The drum started to spin as Zaphod had pumped it. People started to back away from him. Once the drum gets up to speed, it's ready to fire, and you can pump it up faster or slower for different levels of shot. The drum here is a simple monopolar magnet. It's a north pole only. The south magnetic pole is tucked into the center of the drum. It builds up this enormous angular momentum, and when we pull the trigger, that what actually pulled the trigger. Was he drunk? The spinning drum slammed to an immediate stop and out of the trumpet barrel shot a neon orange donut of energy, impacting with a heavy thud on the overhead of the bar. Oops, <laughs> sorry, uh, don't worry, the blaster was designed to not call ship depressurizations. What good is punching a hole in a bounty? There would be nothing to loot, as they used to say. The engineers felt emboldened to ask further. So, uh, how does the drum stopping shoot the gun? Oh, that, uh, I guess you kids don't have any of those, do you? The spinning monopolar magnets with coils around it makes up an old technology called a monopolar generator. Think of it like a mechanical version of a capacitor storing insane amounts of energy as angular momentum. Pull the trigger, connect the coil to the drum, and wham! All the angular momentum of the mass gets pumped down the wires as electromagnetic energy. A literal fuck ton of energy. Limited usefulness, though. It just dumps all 100% of the energy at once. Nothing held back. Limited practical uses for all things like that. The engineers looked at each other. They all clearly disagreed. Anyways, the energy gets pumped to the rod at the barrel. It's just tuned to wavelength for x-rays that get sort of vortex rolled up into a donut as it leaves the barrel. And the rest as well, uh, blammo. Wait, Yeager said, just now catching up. You said... Kids make these as science experiments. End of story. Story number two. How to earn a big bounty from Satan. Written by Glitchkey. Do you know where you are? The man asked. His immaculate suit caught the lambian glow of the ember-filled walls and almost seemed suffused with a fire all its own. The office he sat in was spacious and well-appointed, the bookcases and paintings lining the walls hardly immune to the flaming companions. The man sitting across from him looked around. His dark eyes flicked from object to object before settling back on the man in the suit, patiently waiting for an answer. I'd imagine, he said, a smile teasing at his lips, that this is hell. Would you happen to be Satan? Yes, yes, I would, Satan acknowledged, steepling his fingers in front of him as he stared at the man across from him, who had given up any pretense of neutrality and was grinning quite broadly. It would seem that you also know why you are here, rather than already receiving your due punishment. Would it happen to have anything to do with 
The man drew out the sentence, tapping a hand against his knee as he tried not to laugh. How you tabulate sins? Yes, that would... Satan stopped as his voice was drowned out by laughter and waited for the man to quiet down. His fingers drummed against the desk for a few moments, and then he sighed. A breeze filled the room, and the walls fled to light, interrupting the laughter long enough for him to continue. That would be the case. You have quite an anomalous count of sins. Would you care to explain? Oh, my yes, sir. I certainly would. The man leaned back in his chair and looked around the room before his eyes settled upon an old painting. What a coincidence! Is that Zempro Gauzu? Satan looked at the painting, then back to the man who clearly already knew the answer. Yes, that is him. The man clapped his hands together. Excellent! See, he was part of the inspiration for what I did. It all started ages ago, you see. I came to the horrible realization that I was probably never going to go to heaven. A terrible thing to conclude, you know. He wiped a few tears that clearly didn't exist out of his eye. He grinned belying the action as he did so. I figured, okay, if I'm going to go to hell anyway, I should make sure that I get there in style. I uh, see, Satan said, rubbing his temples. You're not the first, but you are certainly one of the more, he sighed again, creative cases. That doesn't explain what you did, however. Right, I was getting to that. The first thing I realized was that the classic methods were off the table, no better way to live a short and probably miserable life than to try and become a mass murderer in a modern age, he shrugged. So I spent a while thinking, and realized that I'd probably get counted in for convincing other people to commit sins too. Even if it's at something of a discount. Yes, you do, Satan leaned forward, staring straight at the man that he was interviewing. Normally intent is accounted for here as well. However, you caused us to reevaluate our pending cases. We're going to need to adjust accordingly in the future. Anyway, he said, sitting back and gesturing across the desk. Please, continue. So yeah, I figured, okay, I can do this. The man grinned again. Seems I was right, by the way. His smile faded slightly, but the twinkle remained in his eyes. So I decided, hey, we've got this fancy new tech that connects people around the world. Is there a good way to abuse that to create sins in mass? Satan chuckled. The sound hollow even to his ears. Yes, you certainly did that. Every one of the deadly sins and a multitude besides. Committed constantly around the globe. He grimaced as he looked at some paperwork on his desk. Your final numbers are unlikely to finish tabulating anytime soon. As the sins continue to come in, congratulations. You've broken the system. The man simply sat, his grin never fading, as he waited for Satan to continue. So all of your assumptions, correct as they were, Satan paused to stare at the man. All of them led you to? To invent microtransactions. Yes, brilliant piece of work, aren't they? End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and patrons. Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Barky, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Lord Azrakul, and Arcadian. 